Well, first of all, just a word of good morning and welcome to everybody. So glad, especially for our many visitors and guests. My name is Father Brian Sullivan, the new pastor here. I just arrived just this past July. So this is actually my first Easter with you, the, the, the dear parishioners of St. Mary's. So again, uh, welcome and what a great joy for me to be here. And especially to our, our brothers and sisters who are in the nosebleed section. There's a standing room crowd in the back. But don't worry, it won't be like last night. Last night we had a packed house as well. We had the Easter vigil. And so it was standing room only as well. And it was a three-hour mass last night. Praise the Lord. I'm telling you, to be a Christian is it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> so for, for our brothers and sisters in the nosebleed sections, don't worry, it won't be a three-hour mass. Maybe two and a half, maybe. <laughs> in fact, pews are actually a new invention. Did you know that? For the first 1,500 years, our ancestors stood the entire mass. It was only until the Protestant Reformation did pews start coming in. And so for the people in the nosebleed sections, you're actually in good company. You're worshiping like the first Christians for 1,500 years. Happy Easter, everybody. Easter. Last night, oh, it was such a beautiful night. So if you see wax in the pews, we haven't had time to clean it up yet. Because during the Easter vigil, we actually process in in complete darkness. And we come in with lights, little lights. And, of course, during the, the three-hour liturgy, of course, the, the wax wanes and it falls into the pews. So if you see pews or wax in the, all over the church, it was from last night, and we haven't had time to clean up. It's been mass after mass after mass since this morning. We started at 6 a.m., we had an 8 a.m. mass, and then now to 10, and then we'll have a 12, and then a 2, and then a 5. So no time to clean up the church. But last night, it was amazing. About maybe 10 minutes before the Mass started, everything started going haywire. Literally, our sound system starts going crazy. Huh? It starts crashing on us. So you can imagine 10 minutes before a packed house and a long liturgy, we had to rush. And luckily, our brother, Don Kirk, many of you know him, he had to rush in here. He was at home. We gave him a call. He said, Don, it's an emergency. You have to come to the church. The sound system is crashing. And during the entire liturgy, he was, he was just reworking his magic because he's a, some kind of tech whiz with, with sound equipment. And so if you start hearing buzzing, because he had a jury rig it, and so it's, he did some temporary fixing. So if you hear buzzing throughout, that's the reason why. Then also lights started malfunctioning at the Easter vigil. And I said, wait a minute, something's going on here. Somebody doesn't want us to have this Mass. Guess who that was? Oh, I saw our ancient foe's fingertips all over the place. Our ancient foe from the very beginning. Because last night we baptized six new Christians. That means our ancient foe lost six souls. His kingdom became weaker. Our kingdom was strengthened. And not only were six souls newly baptized into the body of Christ, six souls snatched from him, but 20 new confirmed Christians were strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. They received the gifts which transformed the world 2,000 years ago and the apostles. Oh, the evil one, our ancient foe, did not want that last night mass to happen. I guarantee you. And in a few moments after my 45-minute homily this morning, <laughs> we're going to renew our baptismal promises. The same promises all of you have been baptized, you made. Or if you were baptized as a baby, your godparents made on your behalf. And if you're confirmed, you renewed it as well. And when we renew our baptismal promises, I'll ask you the same questions. 
And there's one question in there. Oh, I, I love this question. So I hope when we renew our baptismal vows, I want to invite all of you to respond with a resounding response with, I do. When I, I will ask you that ancient question, do you reject Satan and all of his works and all of his empty promises? And then you will yell out, the mighty church of God, I do. Oh, the evil one trembles at that voice of a confident Christian. As we see here beautifully in all of the readings, our ancient foe is defeated in the most surprising way. You see, our ancient foe thought he had won on Good Friday. He had convinced the crowd to reject Jesus and to crucify him in the most heinous way. Little did he know that the Lord would be faithful to his promises. Matthew 17, our Lord tells his disciples before they had any idea what was about to happen, he said to his disciples, the Son of Man will be arrested, beaten, and crucified. And on the third day, he would rise again. And they had no idea what that meant. What are you talking about, Jesus? I thought you were going to be the, aren't you the long-promised Messiah? Aren't you going to defeat our enemies, rebuild the kingdom? Aren't you going to vanquish our enemies? Oh, they had no idea what was in store. Then Good Friday happens, and just like our Lord had predicted, he was arrested, beaten, and nailed to the cross. And the evil one, our ancient foe, rejoices. We got him. We defeated him. That irritating Jesus is done. He's a liar. He has failed. He is not God in the flesh. His words are empty. And then what happens? On Easter morning, while we're all gathered here this day. And what happens that day, we see beautifully in the gospel. Mary Magdalene, I quote, comes to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark. Ah, oh, Mary Magdalene. Oh, look at her love for Jesus. Look at her love. Jesus has just been defeated, and instead of hiding and cowering in fear like everybody else, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. And then all of a sudden, something amazing happens. The stone is rolled away. The tomb, empty. She runs back and goes to Simon Peter and John, and they tell them the tomb where they laid our Lord is now empty. And then they go running. And I love this little detail here. It said that John outruns Peter. Why? Because I think Peter's out of shape. <laughs> He's got a little tire around his belly, I think. Huh? He's an old man. John here, was, many scholars believe, was just a teenager. Any remember when you were young, when you were teenagers? Oh, we can run like the gazelle, Keep going, huh? run like the wind. And they're so excited, they're running at the, at, towards the tomb. And of course, the young teenager defeats Peter in the race. But amazingly, he stops and out of respect, waits for Peter. In that beautiful detail, Biblical scholars believe that John was bowing 
to the role that Peter would eventually play in the church. Because who was Peter? He is our first pope. Peter would be the rock of which the Catholic Church would be built upon. Do you know how many popes we've had since the time of Peter? We have a continuous line of 266 Peters in the Catholic Church. The longest running institution on planet Earth. Nobody can hold this pedigree like us because of God's faithful promise. Peter goes into the tomb and amazingly, and just as Mary Magdalene had saw, the tomb is empty. The empty tomb, my dear brothers and sisters, changes absolutely everything. Because what the empty tomb signifies It tells us Jesus is always faithful to his promises. Jesus is who he says he is. And if indeed Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, and all of a sudden, life can no longer be the same anymore. If Jesus is indeed raised from the dead, then what that means is that there was more to life than just this. Oh, as the beautiful reading said earlier, think of things that are above rather than things of the earth. Jesus' empty tomb reveals to us our deepest and lofty goal that all of our, or all of us are destined, if we stay faithful to him, to return to our heavenly homeland. We're no longer bound by earth anymore. Ah, but the story even continues. The empty tomb, my friends, changes absolutely everything because that all of a sudden means that our suffering, our pain, our heartache, our anxiety no longer has the final say. You see, the Christian, fully alive, understands that death no longer is our finality. That even in our darkest hour, there is always hope. And all I have to do is point to the cross, because you see, the evil one, the ancient foe, saw Jesus on the cross and said, the end, period, amen. Oh, but the Christian knows who waits for the third day, He understands that Jesus is always faithful to his promises. And it changes everything. A few days ago, I saw the change of how the Christian lives on full display. On Friday, I receive a message from a friend. Something horrible has just happened in Roseville. There was a couple that I've known for almost, gosh, now, how long has it been? Almost 20 years. I knew them even before I was a priest when I was also living in Roseville at the time. I was able to be befriended them. And then at my previous parish, I was in a tiny little town before coming to Vacaville. I was up in the mountains, a little town called Portola. I don't know if many of you know Portola. Tiny little town, 2,100 people. It's about an hour north of Truckee. To kind of give you an idea geographically where it is. And they had a summer home there, so this couple, I was able to see them every summer, and we were close, and so it was, it was great. And they said something horrible's happened to Jim and Patty. They were taking a walk in a park. It was a beautiful afternoon, if you remember, a couple days ago. And all of a sudden, they were caught in a crossfire between police, the California Highway Patrol, and a felon that they were trying to apprehend. And gunshots start raining. And it said that Jim and Patty immediately dived to the ground.
And in my message, they said, Father, Jim didn't make it. Patty's in the hospital. And so at that time, we had confessions on Good Friday, and, and I walk out of the confessional, and oh, we had a hundred people waiting for confession on Good Friday. Literally, the line was out the door. And poor Father Reggie, our other priest here, I said, Father, I'm sorry to, to leave you here with 120 people out the line, but I have to go. He said, all right, if, if I just go. I have, there's an emergency, I have to go. He said, of course, I'll praise God for Father Reggie. Like a soldier, he was in that little box. These boxes, by the way, get hot. Right? He was in there for hours. So I get there to the hospital, Mercy San Juan. And as I'm also driving there, you think to yourself, what am I going to say to this? What do you say to to a family like this? So I go. I walk into the room. She's there in the hospital bed, and the daughter. You knock, of course. And I walk in. Father. And then the tears just break out all over the room. And she tells me what happened. She said that after Jim didn't make it, the felon grabs her, uses her as a human shield against the police. And she said the whole time as, as, she, as she was being held by that felon, she starts to pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Oh, we know that prayer well, don't we, as Catholics? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. She said that as she was praying, the Hail Marys, she started to look up into the sky, and she remarked, oh, the sky is so blue today. Who does that? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And then all of a sudden, a scripture verse pops into her mind. Philippians 4, verse 13. I can do all with Christ who strengthens me. She bounces from that verse to more Hail Marys. Hail Mary full of grace, and boom, Philippians 4. She's going back and forth. And then she says to me, Father, I thank God. Here is a woman who just lost her husband. Here is a woman just fresh out of surgery. This woman, her entire life has been changed. And yet the first thing out of her mouth is, I thank Jesus Christ. Our sister, who in all intents and purposes, the world would say, poor you. Look how horrible your life is now. Look how unjust God is. Look what God has done, allowed this to happen in your life. Oh no. Not the Christian who believes in the empty tomb. Because the Christian understands the cross is never the end. Because if indeed Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead, thank God in all circumstances. 
It doesn't matter how many felons there are. It doesn't matter how many diseases there are. It doesn't matter how many people lose their lives. It doesn't matter how many diseases. It doesn't matter what happens in our circumstances. It doesn't matter what happens in the world because at the end of the day, the tomb is empty. And if the tomb is empty, our Lord has been risen from the dead. That, my friends, is why we gather today. Because our Lord is risen. And our homeland is open to every single person. And all we have to do is be faithful like our sister. Faithful unto the end. And to never allow the evil one, our ancient foe, to drag us to hell with him. Because we're made for heaven. And so now, dear friends, we will renew our promises, our fidelity to our Lord and Savior. And so if you're bold enough, and I think you are, because we are mighty St. Mary's, I invite you to please stand. And so, brothers and sisters, as we did when we were baptized, we were asked certain questions. And I ask you to repeat these same answers as we renew our promises so that we may walk with him, our Lord, in newness of life. Because now that our Lenten observance is concluded, let us renew the promises of holy baptism by which we once renounce Satan and all his works and promise to serve God and the Holy Catholic Church. And so now I ask you, do you renounce Satan? I do. And all his empty works. And all his empty show. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heavens and earth? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered death and was buried, rose again from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? I do. And may Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and bestowed on us forgiveness of our sins, keep us by his grace in Christ Jesus, our Lord, for eternal life. Amen. Amen.